You know, I think I could preach just verse 1. And I said, at this rate, we're never going to get through it. So we compromise and we're going to go through 1 through 6. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is a propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. <clears throat> the message today is, are you real? <laughs> I actually thought of several of titles of this. One was uh, The Real Thing. Another one was uh, Are You In or Are You Out? We're going through the book of 1 John because our theme for the year is discipleship. And as I've been saying to you every week, there's probably not a better book in talking about discipleship and dealing with a broad uh, array of issues, everything from the theological to, to the practical. And we've been really kind of talking about the, pre, the theological the last couple weeks. And tonight we're going to start to get into the theological, I mean the practical a little bit, and then it'll get more practical as we go through. But last week, we talked about everybody's favorite subject. Sin. What was it? Sin. Sin. See, I probably preach on something you remembered. Maybe I need to preach on <laughs> sin more often. Sin. And so John now is picking it up in chapter 2, and he says, my little children... These things I write to you so that you may not sin. So he's kind of following along and, and he's addressing the people as little children. And this is kind of interesting because if I was to stand up here and say, now my little children. There's several problems. Some of you would be offended by that. Secondly, some of you are old enough to be my parents. My, and... Um, it would not quite sit right, but John is writing here, and he's addressing them as little children for a couple of reasons. Number one, John is the last of the apostles. And John is kind of the head figure of the church. 
And he's addressing all of the people. This is not written to one specific person or one specific church. This is a universal letter written to the universal church. And, and he is addressing them with a term of endearment that was accepted in his day. My little children or my loved ones. The other thing is, is as he writes this, he's probably in his 80s. And so he probably could say to them that he was their father figure. And he's writing this letter so that we don't sin. And that's what we've been talking about the last couple weeks is we have got to live under the understanding or with the understanding that God is holy and because God is holy, He wants us to be holy. And it tells us that without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And so John is saying here, I am writing this to you because as we talked last week, there were a number of reasons and excuses that people give for their sin. Some people, they, they just deny sin exists in the first place. Other, they're, 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 they're just kind of playing around with it and, and not really um, acknowledging or, or basically what they're doing is they're deceiving their own, own selves and at the same time trying to deceive others. And then other people are just flat out rebellious and defaming God and blaspheming God and claiming that they don't have any sin. And John is saying, I'm writing to this to you because I do not want you to sin. But, or end, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with a father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now, this is a really important point. Because one of the problems with preaching a message like I preached last week is we have a lot of people, and there are a lot of people in this community who have been raised up with the idea that Jesus Christ and God the Father are against us. That they're walking around looking for, investigating, trying to find places in our lives where we have failed, where we have sinned, so that they can just come and put their foot and the boot on the back of our neck and just crush us and keep us down. That God is looking for reasons to reject us. That God is looking for reasons to send us to hell. That God is looking for flaws in our lives so that He can judge and condemn us and so that He can walk away from us. And we have people that have been serving God for 10, 20, 40, 60 years and they still live in under this spirit and this idea that God just wants to get them. And they just need to try a little harder. And they just need to work a little more. And they just need to discipline themselves. And they do all of these things. And they're living in bondage to a lie. Why? Because... Jesus Christ himself is our advocate. What does that mean? The word advocate means that Jesus Christ comes along beside us and he helps us. And in, in, in the book of John, Jesus said it's expedient that I go away because if I go away, I can send you another comforter. That word comforter is the same word as advocate here. And, and, and so Jesus himself, we have the Holy Spirit who is our comforter, who is our helper. But now it's saying Jesus himself is our helper. Jesus is the one, and it also means that Jesus is the one who is going to come to our defense. He is going to argue our case. Listen, God is not out to get you. He doesn't want you to sin. But the reality is, He knows 
that we were born in a conditioned state and a tendency towards sin, and He knows that all of us, whether we believe it or not, whether we accept it or not, He knows that each and every person in this room is going to fall short and is going to sin. He says, but if you sin, don't worry about it because Jesus Christ himself is the one who is going to defend you. Because it tells us that Satan is the accuser and Satan is accusing us night and day before God the Father. And Jesus is right there saying, that's true. That's true, God. I saw Erica do that. I saw Bonnie do that. I, it's true, God. I saw that. They're guilty, but they're mine. I have paid for it. God, don't judge them. God, don't hold it against them because I've already paid the price. And we need to grasp that truth. That God is not against us. God is for us. God is not trying to put his boot on our neck to crush us. He's trying to remove Satan's boot from us. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. If you sleep the rest of the service, that's fine. But please get this point. God is not against you. He is for you. God does not want you to fail. He wants you to succeed. God loves you so much that he takes and he has you in his hand and nothing and no one, not even Satan or your sin can take you out of God's hand, because Christ's hand, because Christ is now in God's hand and nothing is powerful enough to take you out of their hands, period. God himself is on your side. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, we come to the next point. Verse 2. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. Coco, how many papers in school have you used the word propitiation for? Mm -hmm. <laughs> propitiation he himself who Jesus Christ is the propitiation for our sin what does that mean it means that he's not only our advocate but look at what he does here because of our sin the Bible says that God is holy and no one can see, see God at any time so because of our sin God has judged us God has condemned us God has convicted us guilty. And each and every one of us are guilty before God. Well, that's encouraging news. And because we're guilty, we are deserving of one thing and one thing only. God's wrath upon us. So what happened was, while we were in our sins and while we were guilty, they strung Jesus up. And while he was on that cross, every sin that you and I have ever committed and ever will commit was the wrath of God was placed on Jesus Christ at that moment and at that time. And he bore the pain and the penalty and God's wrath for our sins. And so not only did he defend us, but he took in the, pe the, the penalty away in the first place. Have you ever thought about this? I have never in my life seen so many people, particularly leaders, 
not just exiting, but running from the church. And over and over and over, I'm coming across former pastors, former elders, former deacons, former Sunday school teachers, former musicians, former church council members and board of directors who are not only not going to church, they don't ever plan on darking in the door of a church ever again. But when we look at and we realize what Jesus Christ has done for you and I, how can you walk out of a church like that? How can you walk out on the love that God has for us? I was in working in the, in the, in the city of L.A. And this Indian guy came down one day. And um, he was at the front desk. And uh, I had talked to him about the church and about Christ and different things. And he came down and... and uh, he was a brilliant guy, had a master's in engineering, and came down and just said, you know, in my country, I went to church, but I didn't get anything out of it. And so I left the church, and in talking to you, he says, I, you know, I've been thinking about it, he says, I got one question for you. What does the church have to offer me? And my response? Nothing. Nothing. But Jesus. Yes. Yes. See, the problem is we're so busy looking at the church and the flaws and the problems of the church, we've lost Jesus someplace in the picture. We need to forget about all of the mess around us, put our eyes on Jesus, and become Jesus people and Jesus fanatics. And when we do that, this other stuff isn't going to matter. Amen. Because the mess is everywhere. And if it isn't, it'll show up as soon as you get there. <laughs> The mess is everywhere. But Jesus. Amen. Jesus gave his life. And he bore the wrath that you and I deserve. What more could we ask for? Now, we come to verse 3. Now by this, we know that we love him. <clears throat> Excuse me, we know him. Verse 4. He who says, I know him. Verse 5. By this we know that we are in him. <clears throat> One of the things about the book of 1 John is it gives us a number of tests. John is telling us and in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it tells us to examine ourselves to see if we are truly in the faith. Excuse me, 2 Corinthians. <clears throat> to examine ourselves and see if we are really in the faith. John now is going to start giving us a series of tests so that we can examine ourselves and see if we are truly in the faith. This week, something interesting happened. I'm sure most of you saw it. I was amazed by it. And please, this is not a political statement, so just, you know, hold your, your anger before I get the whole story out. This last week, the Pope rebuked our president. Openly. <laughs> and said, you call yourself a Christian, you are not. And then he gave a series of reasons. Now, I'm not here to talk about whether he is or he isn't, or whether the Pope did or said the right thing. That's, 
But what I want you to see is the Bible tells us two things. Number one, we are to examine ourselves. So from that standpoint, the Pope was wrong. But on the other side, the Bible also tells us by their fruits, you will know them. And the Pope was judging fruit that he saw coming from President Trump. Now whether that is wrong, whether his assessment is wrong, that's not the point. The point is this. Two things. Number one, God is going to judge you and he wants you therefore to judge yourself to see whether or not you and I are truly in the faith. Because once we do that, it doesn't matter what anybody, the Pope included, says or thinks. But at the same time, the people around us are going to be looking at us and looking at our fruit. And they are going to be evaluating us based on a number of these things that I'm going to be talking about in the next few minutes. And so, the, 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 the today, tonight's message is, are you for real? And now he's going to give us three ways that we can look at ourselves. Not forget about the person sitting next to you. Forget about the, you know, the, the, the other Christians and people that you know. Forget about all the failures of others. What I want you to do now is I want you to look within and look at yourself and examine yourself and the fruit that is coming out of you as it bears to these points. Number one. He who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever... We'll stop there. He who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. Now, you remember the first message I said there were some things that I really don't know. Really, I don't think somebody should preach this until they're in their 70s. <laughs> I thought about asking Ray and Laverne to team teach this. <laughs> I'm not sure, Laverne might not be 70 yet, but I, I still, she was in my mind to, to team teach. Because I think they might have a better idea than I do about some of these things we're going to come across. But, but see, there's a problem right here. This is one of those things that I can't explain. Why? Because the commandments are Old Testament. The commandments are law. The commandments, Jesus came and fulfilled those laws. And we are no longer under the commandments. We are under grace. That's the whole purpose of Jesus coming. He threw the law away because all the law did was condemn us. All the law did was fight against us. Jesus came by his grace when we wasn't deserving, became the propitiation. Now he's our advocate. Why? Because we're under grace, no longer under the law. But John says we have to keep in the commandments. I think that what he's referring to is Jesus' statement. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And the second is like unto it, love thy neighbor as thyself. I think that what John is talking about here is your attitude towards holiness, your attitude towards sin. Your attitude towards following the, love, the law of love that God has given to us. Because there are a whole lot of people sitting in churches every weekend. There, there, there's a story, a, a, a video, I encourage you to watch it if you've never seen it. It's, it's called, Lord, Save Us From Your Followers. <laughs> And, and, and in that video, it shows a whole lot of people who are keeping God's commandments, but they're angry about it. <laughs> they're hateful in doing it. 
<laughs> in keeping the commandments, grace, love, and mercy were thrown out. I, I think that's what he's addressing here when he says that. Okay, well, I, I, I'll come to church and I don't want to go, but I, I stay home. <laughs> Why have a bad evening? Stay home. I, here they come. Keep, they're going to pass the offering plan again. Keep the money in your pocket. Come with an attitude like that. God knows He's not going to bless you anyway, so you might as well just keep it right there. Well, you know, I don't know why she uh, she comes to church. She dresses that way, and that's just so inappropriate. What business is it of yours? Thank you. We have what we think is this holiness and this purity and this righteousness. But we're angry and bitter and doing it. He says, no. The commandment is out of love. Not out of force. Not against your will. But because God loves us, and because we love Him, now we are able to love others. And all of the law and the prophets are wrapped up into those two laws. How was your attitude? How was your attitude towards God? How was your attitude towards living a holy life? How was your attitude towards sin? How was your attitude towards others? Point two, second test. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is per perfected. The Word of God, right here. Do you love this Word? Do you read this Word? Do you even bother to blow the dust off from the Word and, and bring it to church once every three weeks? Come on. You know, you can't keep his word if you don't know anything that's in it. This is no lie. I asked somebody one time who was a leader in a church, and they opened the covenant. They don't read the Bible at all. And I asked him, why don't you read it? He said, because if I read it, then I might feel obligated to do some of what it says. <laughs> huh? Lord have mercy. Mm -hmm. We laugh about that, but many of us subconsciously have the same attitude. If I don't know, I don't have to do it. I don't have to be accountable for it. And, and we, we come up with all of these concepts. And we present them as God's truth in His Word. When in reality, many of them don't even have any type of basis in God's Word. And we take God's Word on one side and our traditions and standards on the other. And what really matters to us is our traditions and our standards and our goal. And, and part of the reason is because we've never taken the time to read what God has to say in the first place. Nor are we interested in doing it. And if we did read it, we would, we would have to talk to James who would say, don't just be a hearer, but be a doer of God's Word. And that's what gives us a problem because we like where we are right now and don't want to be challenged to live any differently. And John is saying, do you love His Word?
And love is an action word. Because now we come to the third point. And the third point is you must walk as Jesus walked. How did Jesus walk? He wasn't so angry and bitter that all the children ran away from him. <laughs> My pastor used to say, the older I get, the more candy I put in my pocket. <laughs> he said, I don't want to be that bitter old man. He said, I just soon have the parents mad at me for giving their kids candy. <laughs> Do you walk as Jesus walked? How did Jesus walk? In obedience. In love, in grace, in mercy, with compassion, with understanding. He did things that the average church person, and particularly pastors, would not do today. He accepted people and embraced them that people today are running out of the church. I'll never forget, I, I think I've told this story here. We was in New York City starting a, a church in the Bronx. And we're knocking on doors, and this young couple came back afterward all excited. They knocked on the store, and the lady that opened it from the other side was a prostitute. And she started crying because her father was a Baptist pastor. And she wanted to get her life right with God. And she accepted Jesus Christ as her Savior right there. And then she had the audacity to show up to church. <clears throat> this is no lie. I had three Baptist pastors who were running a, a different program so that we're not filling the pulpit at the time, who were attending the church who came to me and said she should not be here. Why? Because there are young people and stuff in the church and we don't want to give the impression if she stays, we're leaving. She's still in that church, the last I knew. And they left. Jesus touched the untouchable. You know, <clears throat> Dr. Rod has the Park family. And I gotta tell you, that do you know this is why that Park family impresses me so much. And I go down there once a month and, and, and feed and because he does things that I would not do. Homeless person. Hadn't had a bath in three weeks. I've got a sore on my leg. Let me lay hands on you and pray for you. I've seen people walk into church who weren't homeless, but they weren't maybe... Uh, they had a real vibrant odor about them. And so four or five people get up and walk away. Do we walk as Jesus walked? Do we live as he lived? Do we look for reasons to serve and give ourselves away to others? Regardless of the cost and the price to us personally. Are we willing to go the extra mile? Or is it all about me and my comforts? John is saying, are you for real? 
Number one, check your attitude. Number two, do you love and obey God's word? Number three, do you walk and live as Jesus walked? He says, examine yourself. And see, are you in or are you out? Because it's all about the heart. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. And God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truths that are in your word. We thank you for the tests that are given to us. And God, I ask that your spirit would move through this place right now and allow each and every one of us to check ourselves, to examine ourselves, and to see whether or not we are in alignment with you to check our attitude, to check whether we are in your word and in love with your word. And are we walking as Jesus walks? And right now, Father, we just come and we just confess to you. That we have fallen short. God, help us to adjust our attitude. God, give us a love and a passion for your word. And a desire to put it into practice and live it out. And most importantly, God, fill us with your Holy Spirit lead and guide us and help us. Help us, Father, to walk as Jesus walked. All around us there are people that are in need of a touch from you. Help us to stop walking around and walking over those people, but God, to give us eyes to see and a heart of compassion to feel. And a willing spirit to act, Father. That the people around us would see Jesus through us. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Yeah.